Hey everybody, uh, tonight I decided I'd come down here and had a little time, figured I'd mess around with this uh, circuit on this uh, pressure switch assembly for my Fantech dryer booster motor. Um, those of you who saw part one, you already saw the symptom that it was having and was able to determine that it's definitely some something on this electronic circuit board that's actually the culprit. I, I could buy this entire assembly as a replacement, but it's about 75 bucks, so I figured, uh, what the heck, maybe I'd see if I can do anything about it. And Still got a couple of fans of the IH350 tractor hanging on. Uh, I tell you, not a day goes by that I don't, uh, well, not a weekend anyways that goes by that I don't tend to walk by there and give a glance just to make sure it's still sitting where it was sitting weeds are pretty tall around it i'm gonna have to put my kid to work with the uh weed whacker to get uh get some access to it but that is definitely uh that's definitely on the horizon i am on the verge of firing off the airco as a tig welder for the first time and striking my first tig arcs uh so we're gonna get that going practice a little bit of tig and then we're gonna get back to work on the ih350 project i hope but for tonight we're going to just play around with this thing. So I, I, I can wire this up temporarily uh, to do my testing. But before I even bother doing that, I think I'm going to start right off the bat. I'm just going to take these two screws out, remove this board, and get a look at the back side of the board and make sure there aren't any uh, broken solder connections. Uh, could very well be that, that something wasn't soldered right at the factory and that the uh, vibration of the motor running has uh, knocked something loose which would make this a uh, 10 minute job of just uh, you know firing up the solder and iron reflowing some solder connections and boom although I I, I kind of doubt that's the case but I gotta gotta look at all possibilities so uh, nothing remarkable to see there nothing that stands out as a glaring problem as far as that goes. Let's see what's going on behind here. What's behind this magic curtain? Let me push this cable out so I got more room. Well, that's interesting. So they're actually using the actual connection to the uh, the actual connections to the actual pressure switch itself are actually. The screws that I just unscrewed. Oh, you like them apples. Now I know that this pressure switch is working. So I know the problem isn't here. But the way this is supposed to work is that when the pressure switch closes, that sends a signal and that tells the board to close this relay and run the fan. And then when the pressure switch opens, it sends a signal and, the, and this circuit is supposed to then run the fan for several more minutes before opening the relay and shutting it off. Okay? And also, I believe if there's a momentary loss of uh, pressure that causes the, um, um, causes the thing to open, it's not going to shut it down right away. So it's not a case of this actually, this pressure switch actually being the switch that turns on and off the power to this, uh, the power to the fan is not running through the switch. This is a very low voltage switch that's actuating the circuit. So I can leave this disconnected and just use a jumper to go from here to here, momentary contact that should fire this off for my testing purposes. So... Since I can do that, I think what I'll do to make my life easier and just to keep keep from having the uh, accidental uh, the possibility of accidentally shorting something against this metal case, I'm going to undo this ground screw, and that will allow me to actually pull this whole cable out voila all right so let's see if i can give you a better look at the circuit there's not much going on here 
And I don't mean my thought process. I mean on this board. It's really a quite a simple circuit. The type of failure, it almost seems like something's gone squirrely so that the time constant is all wrong. And I mean, it could be a value of a resistor that's changed quite significantly, or it could also be maybe a capacitor that's changed in value. I don't know. Um, I mean, it could be a semiconductor too. I don't know. So I'm going to look at these uh, two capacitors right here under magnification because these types of surface mount caps are notorious for failure. And sometimes when these caps fail, they leak out a substance onto the connections. And that substance is often very corrosive. All right, so I wired up a temporary circuit here. I've got the uh, light bulb on the uh, red wire, which is the load wire. The uh, other side of the light bulb is on the neutral. Um, the power coming in is on the neutral and the black wire, which is line. I've got that plugged into a, a switch terminal strip. So as soon as I turn the uh, switch on, the circuit is now live. And what should happen is if I jumper from one screw terminal hole to the other screw terminal hole uh, that should trigger the circuit all right since it wasn't turning on um, I decided to reinstall the board so that now the uh, pressure switch is attached to the circuit and uh, I just tried it and it works so and I think maybe I just wasn't holding it long enough because it turns out when the pressure switch closes there's a, an initial slight delay before it turns on the relay and uh, now I'll demonstrate exactly what the problem's been all along. So you can see what happens to the pressure switch closes. There's a slight delay relay turns on for for maybe one second shuts off and it just keeps repeating that even though I'm keeping the uh, pressure on and the pressure switch closed now let me talk talk briefly about what I know about this circuit which is very little but uh, we've got two IC chips in here uh, there's an IC chip over here marked as U1 and it turns out this is a microcontroller it's a 12F509 something, which I guess is a pretty common uh, microcontroller designed to run at 4 megahertz. So I believe this device right here to the left of it, that that's going to be the uh, probably a uh, crystal oscillator. In other words, this device right here I think is a crystal oscillator. There's the microcontroller. This over here is uh, marked VR, and this is a little 8-pin voltage regulator, and it's designed to take a uh, pretty high DC input voltage, and I think it's supposed to be outputting 5-volt DC, and that's probably what runs this microcontroller. So it looks like what they're doing is they're taking, there's no transformer here, so it's not a switching power supply or anything like that. It's a much more, it's much cruder. <laughs> Uh, application it looks like they're dropping the voltage down through a resistor and uh, sending the raw well they're taking that AC they've got to be rectifying it it's probably just half wave rectification happening here with this diode and then uh, they must be filtering it with this cap and sending it right into this little voltage regulator and sending 5 volts out to the microcontroller this is all just a guess. What I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to take a little bit of freeze spray that I've got, and I'm just going to while I'm while I'm running the unit and it's malfunctioning, I'm going to try and super cool a couple of these components, like a couple of the caps and stuff, and just see whether or not anything uh, drastically changes.
Oh, there we go. Big change there. So it looks like either the microcontroller itself or something I hit right near the microcontroller is what made this this on time and off time start to change quite a bit. So, um, and that kind of falls in line with the failure that I saw. This wasn't a, a sudden failure where it went to this mode suddenly. It uh, seemed like it started acting up and acting a little strangely, having uh, periods where it would shut down um, and then start up again, even though the dryer was still running. Uh, I caught it doing that a couple times and didn't think anything of it and uh, turned out that that was the uh, the onset of the failure it had had you know it was on its way out so to speak so the question is what exactly am I altering there now there is a capacitor C5 that is directly above that microcontroller I'm not sure whether or not I'm altering the capacitance of C5 if it's the microcontroller itself there's probably not much I can do about it I really don't have yeah but I mean it would be tricky as hell for me to well actually I was just gonna say it'd be very hard for me to unsolder that and replace it and then it just occurred to me I think that's programmable anyway so from what I read online so even if I got a microcontroller to replace it it's gonna it would need to be programmed and I'd have no idea what the hell that was supposed to have in it for a program so let's just see see if I can't drip just a tiny bit on just the uh, um, capacitor I think C5 is the culprit. Can't quite tell whether or not it's the microcontroller that I'm uh, that I'm hitting there and uh, altering something inside the microcontroller, the chip itself, or. And I was just blowing through the straw. My hot breath should alter something. And now I'm getting very long off time. Well, I have any, I, I have quite a few doubts that it's going to help any, but I am going to reflow the solder connections on the eight pins on the IC and the, uh, capacitor in question that I seem to be focusing all of the uh, attention on and just see what happens. Hmm. Son of a gun. Just for the heck of it, I hit uh, Q1, which is a transistor over there, and CR3, which is probably a diode, and it's fixed. That's all I had to do. Well, it's not fixed. What I mean to say is that it works. It's working. I, I have now stopped blowing in and it's staying on. So what's happening is it's in its uh it's in its a little uh timeout mode there where it's not now counting down and it's gonna be on for so many minutes and then it'll shut down. Uh, I'm not gonna wait for that. I'm gonna power the unit down and I'm going to trigger the switch again now it's back to doing what it was doing before Let's see what happens when I hit Q1 yeah it's Q1 I'm betting Q1's leaky I think Q1's the culprit. All right, so I just for the heck of it tried resoldering the uh, connections on that transistor. And 
then again, cool the transistor and the problem goes away. It's been actually a few days or actually a couple of weeks since I worked on this Fantech thing, so I don't remember quite where I left off uh, with the video information, but basically I determined that uh, Q1 was the cause of the problem, and Q1 had the markings on it, I believe, K7Y, and did a little bit of research online and was able to determine pretty definitively, I'm pretty confident that this was a uh, N-channel MOSFET. Um, MOSFET stands for, what's the MOS stand for? Metal oxide substrate, maybe? Uh, and the FET, F-E-T, is field effect transistor. So uh, that's kind of a mouthful, so they shortened it to MOSFET. So a MOSFET, uh, when you test it with a regular diode checker on a multimeter, it doesn't test uh, like you would normally expect it to test, which is why I was getting strange readings on that transistor. That transistor wasn't completely open. It wasn't completely shorted. It was more than likely leaky or something else had changed inside of it. That's my suspicion anyways. So I decided to just find an N-channel MOSFET that I could salvage out of something. And I don't know if this is going to work, if it's got a prayer, but what I ended up doing was I ended up finding this device here which is quite a bit larger this is marked MTD3302 by a company called On Semiconductors and this is an N-channel MOSFET it's the same type of device but the specs are a lot different now most of the specs are higher in other words it's able to dissipate more power it's able to allow more current to flow so that's all good if anything it's going to make this circuit even more robust than it already was because this that little tiny transistor there was driving just this little relay and this was driving something much more involved more likely switch mode power supply or something like that because I stole that out of an old first-generation Xbox. Those of you who follow my videos regularly know that at some point I was playing around with a couple of broken Xboxes, and I was able to actually get this one to come back online, even though the power supply had a big crack in it. Oh, no, it wasn't that. It was this device right here was busted off. Anyways, um, so this had a bad drive in it. Um, not the hard drive, the uh, optical drive. But right here, you can see there's a couple of surface mount devices right here. That spot right there is where I stole that end channel out of. There's another one right here, but in the process of trying to unsolder this one, I think I damaged this one, if I recall correctly. So that's why I bailed out on that one and got that one out. It was kind of tough to get those out. Now, the problem is that th this whole substrate here on the PC board, they're using this to act kind of like a heat sink. Well, I mean, not kind of like. I mean, that's essentially what they're doing. But I was able to finally get that unsoldered. Another thing I had to be concerned about was I had to be concerned about the pinning or pinout of the device. Now, um, kind of hard to see, but there is actually, if you look really closely, you'll see that there are three legs on this device on the bottom. And uh, I don't know if that's going to focus. But there's three legs on the bottom there, and the middle leg is clipped off. And the reason why the middle leg is clipped off in this in this application was because they didn't use that middle leg as the connection. They used this tab at the top, which was common to the middle leg. So the three connections on this one are going to be the left leg, the right leg, and the top. So I'm going to have to run a wire off of that to make a third leg for that third connection. I actually think this is going to help me because I don't have I really don't have I'm not really not equipped for doing surface mount device soldering and desoldering so this might actually help me uh, put this in there without completely butchering it so getting back to the pinout on a conventional transistor you have three connections you have the 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 emitter the base and the collector well on a field effect transistor you have the uh, the gate the source and the drain the gate kind of acts like the base and the uh, uh, the source and drain or your emitter and collector and I forget which ones are which but no matter so the most important thing is I was able to look up online and found the find the pinout for both the original device which I have now lost because it was so tiny 
uh, little K7Y and uh, this device here. And they both share the same pinout, which is going left to right um, gate drain source. So um, that being said, I should be able to use this. So the only thing that's going to make this not work is, what, is if the drive that's supposed to turn this transistor on is not sufficient to turn on this larger transistor. And the only way I'm going to really find that out is by trial and error. So let's put this in and see what happens. So I started by soldering, tack soldering on some really thin wire that I basically I just tore open a little section of Category 5 cable. Got some really thin gauge solid conductor wire and tacked it on there to make little extensions. Because the two leads, the outer leads, the, uh, the gate and the drain leads are far enough apart that I, I'm not going to be able to solder, just solder them directly onto the board. Uh, so now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to flow some solder on the pads and see if I can't get these leads to stick in there. Well, it's in. Uh, quick check with the ohm meter to make sure I don't have any uh, shorts. All right, so now I'm ready for my first test. Um, what should happen is when I energize the circuit, no smoke should come out of this. <laughs> and uh, the light should be off. And then when I blow into this tube and close the pressure switch, uh, the light should, shortly after that happens, the light should turn on. And then I should be able to stop blowing in the tube, the pressure switch will open, and the light should remain on for 10 minutes. Um, at which point, the light would then come back on again if there's still positive pressure at the pressure switch, uh, if the pressure switch is still closed. So let's uh, try this out. I think what I'll do is I'll set my timer. And this isn't going to be exactly 10 minutes because there'll be a slight delay, a little lag there from the time that I start the timer. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do the we'll do the stopwatch feature. All right, and let's energize the circuit. All right, and let's close close the pressure switch. Now we open the switch, not blowing in the tube anymore, and we'll see how this goes. Well, that's interesting. It just shut off at five minutes. And I mean, that's like, was almost dead on five minutes. I also don't know whether or not the timer starts to count down the five minute countdown or the timer countdown. I don't know if it starts it when the pressure switch opens or from the time the light comes on. I'm assuming it's from the time the pressure switch opens, so I'm going to try that again. Close the switch. I heard a little click of the switch opening, and that's when I started my stopwatch. Well, we're coming up on five minutes here, and I've tested this a couple times, and it seems to always be a five-minute mark. And then I uh, found the full manual for installation manual for a DB10 pressure switch. And when I read the manual, it becomes a little more clear. They're talking about that uh, it'll run the dryer for 10 minutes as long as the switch is closed. And then at the end of 10 minutes, I guess it then decides whether or not it's going to shut the dryer down. And then it'll continue to run five minute cycles, consecutive cycles. So it'll run five more minutes. And if the switch is still closed at the end of five minutes, it will run another five minute. It'll start another five minute cycle. If during a five minute cycle, the switch opens, the pressure switch opens, then it will complete that five minute cycle and shut off. So we should shut down at five minutes. All right on the dot. So I think this is repaired. I've got one other thing I've got to address, which is um, my whole uh, deal here with this switch uh, with this uh, MOSFET I actually just noticed now that I'm I'm a little worried that the top of the MOSFET is uh, which is the uh, source I'm sorry the drain 
connection on the MOSFET is going to be in very close proximity to the cover when the cover's on. So I need to, I'm going to try and very carefully bend this back down backwards a little bit so it's below this edge right here. And hopefully I can do that without, I mean it is so close, well actually now that I look at it maybe it isn't going to hit. Well, just for a little added insurance, I'm going to try and bend it back. Hopefully, I won't end up lifting any of the runs off of the uh, off of the, the PC board. All right, I just finished reassembly. I rerouted the cable back through the strain relief. I installed that piece of cardboard around the perimeter, um, screwed the uh, board back in. Everything's all back together, and just rewired it back up temporarily so I can do one more test. Uh, of it assembled to make sure everything's okay before I go to reinstall this up on the third floor rafters there because uh, I'm going to probably have to wait till later today to do that. It's 92 degrees and humid today and up there it's going to be oppressively hot. As today's the kind of day that you just can't do anything without breaking a sweat. So let's uh, make sure this thing works before I go through the trouble of going all the way back up there. All right, looks good. All right, and five minutes later, it shut off again. So I'm satisfied that this is a successful repair uh, as far as the fact that it's working the way it should work. Whether or not it's going to be a long-lasting repair, well, only time's going to tell. Uh, I mean, theoretically, this should be even a more robust circuit than what I had in there because that MOSFET is rated for such a higher current. Uh, even though that MOSFET wants to be heat sunk in order to obtain those kind of, you know, to be able to sustain that kind of current, I'm asking it to do a much smaller job. So I think just leaving it floating in the air like that should be okay. And then as far as vibration goes, you know, whether or not that's going to be a problem down the road, well, none of the other components seem to be suffering from any kind of fatigue of that nature. They didn't put celastic all over all the components and bond them in position on the PC board so I don't think they were too concerned about vibration